So in this video or series of videos, we're going to talk all about anxiety disorders. And what you're going to notice is that in the DSM-5, anxiety disorders have been separated out from obsessive compulsive related disorders and have also been separated from stress related disorders like PTSD and acute stress. We will have videos covering obsessive compulsive related conditions as well as videos on stress related disorders uh, but uh, that will come in the uh, upcoming next lecture or two. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to make a distinction between is the concept of fear versus anxiety. When we refer to fear, that's your central nervous system's physiological or emotional response to some serious threat to one's well-being. Now, fear has a clear threat, a clear uh, danger, whereas anxiety is your central nervous system's response to some vague sense of threat or danger. If you are, I don't know, let's say you are on a safari and you're taking a tour of a nature reserve and a lion approaches your vehicle, that is not anxiety, that is fear, right? Because there is a serious threat and it comes from a clear source. Anxiety is more ambiguous. So a person with anxiety might have some sense of uneasiness or apprehension um, that comes from this anxiety, but more often than not, a person may not even know why they're feeling the way they do it. Common sources of anxiety could be when a person's uh, value system or self-esteem is threatened. For example, some people have um, an anxiety as it relates to public speaking. And that comes as a function of their self-esteem potentially being threatened. Now, whenever we give a talk, whenever we give a presentation, we do have in the back of our mind, what do other people think of me? That is a normal thought. So the idea of our self-esteem being threatened, if we give a presentation or a talk and it doesn't go well, sure, that could induce anxiety. So when we talk about the case of anxiety, um, it's interesting, there was a study on public speaking and they didn't use the word anxiety, but they used the word fear. And they asked people to rate their fears and they gave them different choices as to what a person could be afraid of. And one option was fear of public speaking. Another option was fear of death and a whole bunch of others. And what they found was the fear or anxiety, which I'm presenting it as, related to public speaking was higher than the fear of death. So imagine the person who has to give the eulogy. It's possible that that person would rather be in the box. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit playful or facetious, but think about that for a second, how serious there could be a threat to one's self-esteem, and that induces anxiety. Anxiety is oftentimes anticipatory, so it can precede new experiences. So imagine you were moving out of your house or... Um, getting engaged or going away for college. All of these new experiences, even though they're positive, can induce anxiety because there's uncertainty attached to these new experiences. 
Now, when we talk about anxiety, there are three types of anxiety. There's normal anxiety, there's acute anxiety, and chronic anxiety. Anxiety is a natural response to a perceived threat. So the, some anxiety is normal and appropriate. So if I were to say that we're going to have a pop quiz and you started to feel nervous about what's going to be on the quiz, that's a normal reaction to uh, someone declaring a pop quiz because there's a potential threat to one's performance. So, and that anxiety is beneficial in this case because it's gonna motivate you to study. There are uh, pathological types of anxiety. Uh, we talk about them as anxiety disorders. So anxiety disorders are when a person becomes incapacitated by their feelings of anxiety. Now, anxiety can come in an acute or chronic form. So an acute condition is something that is high intensity, short duration, oftentimes triggered by some imminent loss or change. Whereas chronic anxiety is long-term anxiety. Now you're going to see a a period of time for chronic disorders that is pretty recurring. The threshold for a chronic condition oftentimes is six months or longer, right? So you'll, you'll see that with a lot of disorders. Now that doesn't mean that it's gonna go away in six months. It just means that the anxiety has persisted for a minimum of six months. So these are our types of anxiety. Now, if we were to look at uh, anxiety disorders, anxiety disorders have superseded mood disorders as it relates to psychological disorders. What do I mean by that? Anxiety disorders are the most frequently occurring condition in the DSM. It used to be major depressive disorder. Now anxiety has superseded it. So we know that 18% uh, of individuals in a given year are going to manifest an anxiety disorder. And across the lifespan, it's almost 30%. So that is pretty, pretty significant. Now, depending on the condition, there are going to be different frequencies of seeking treatment, but on average, it's only about 20% of individuals are seeking treatment. Now, this is our first section on psychological disorders. So we're going to talk about anxiety disorders first, but I will tell you that it is possible for a, an individual to have co-occurring disorders. Meaning if you're diagnosed with one psychological disorder, it's not uncommon for a person to suffer from a second or a third psychological disorder. So when, it, when we talk about anxiety disorders, the most frequently occurring co, uh, co, uh, comorbidity or co-occurring diagnosis is depression. And if you were to ask yourselves why, does anyone have a hypothesis why anxiety and mood disorders are so comorbid or co-occurring? Catalina, why do you think anxiety and mood disorders co-occur so frequently? I feel like um, they kind of, I don't know, they can proceed like because you're depressed and you're feeling a certain way, you don't want, I don't know, I feel like um, they kind of correlate with each other. They definitely correlate. Now yeah. you're making a point that I, I think is a good one that 
anxiety does not always precede depression. It could be depression precedes anxiety, right? Um, in the case that you presented, depression came first. But you will see within 10 years of one diagnosis, whether it be anxiety or depression, it is highly likely that the other diagnosis will show up. Chastity, can you think of another reason why anxiety and mood disorders, particularly uh, depression, uh, are so co-occurring? Um, could you like explain that differently? I'll ask it differently, but I'm asking yeah. you for your hypothesis. My question is, why is it in your mind that anxiety and depression go hand in hand? Um, I feel like because we're just so, people with anxiety are like worried so much. And then it could like lead them to focus on that one feeling and they can't um, feel how they're feeling in the present. You know what I mean? I don't uh, know if that makes sense. I'm not sure if you explain how it's linked to depression, though. Um, Professor, can I say something? Yeah, of course. Let's uh, take your peer off the hook. Okay. So I think anxiety... Is to, um, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it works. You know, sometimes anxiety could be the first uh, disorder that comes to people. Or in some cases, for some people, maybe depression might be the first, you know, disorder. Uh, right. uh, you know, that was a point I made. Uh, but, but I think uh, most of the time, I think anxiety first happens before depression. Maybe not. Okay. But... Uh, I think it could lead to depression because of not like uh, being treated, I guess. If you don't treat the anxiety, then, you know, because of not having a treatment, I think it can lead to uh, depression. So this is our first really good explanation that we have, is that the social dysfunction related to anxiety could lead to feelings of sadness, isolation, depression. Right. So that's from a social level. Can, I know one of our colleagues here is very bio driven. So, George, can you give me a biological explanation as to why anxiety? And uh, I, I would say the part of the brain amygdala uh, is responsible for our like um, behavior, like surroundings. So I would say that anxiety and disorder, uh, sorry, anxiety and depression are both related to this part of the brain area, so. So it's actually not the amygdala, it's actually the hypothalamus. And there is something called the HPA axis. Hypothalamus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pituitary. Yeah, pituitary. Yeah, that's correct. I'm sorry. And the HPA axis is responsible for hormones like cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Uh, and stress is the universal trigger to mental illness. And cortisol is linked to both anxiety and depression. So from a pathway point of view, the HPA axis is an explanation for the comorbidity. Uh, Victoria, you have your hand up. Your hand up. Um, I actually, I kind of have a question about this. Would the first time that you said that question, I was thinking, would the symptoms be a correlation between the two? Because, like you said, they both include stress and like other symptoms are like That's similarities. Yes. Would that count as to your question? So that's a good question and the and and a good thought as well, is that they do share some symptomology as well, right? Uh, so social isolation, uh, paralysis, 
distractibility, um, motivation related um, interference. So they do share some of the symptoms with one another. Uh, so that is a good point. Thank you. Uh, Chastity, you have your hand up. I have a question too. Mm -hmm. um, would certain medication for anxiety lead to depression? Lead to depression? Or, or alleviate depression? Um, I guess alleviate. Yeah, because the idea that the medication is going to cause depression, typically not. But alleviating depression, you're on to something if, if that's the question. Because we know that anxiety disorders and mood disorders are linked to serotonin, right? And norepinephrine. So these monoamines are, are linked to the treatment of anxiety and depression. So you'll see... SSRI, things like uh, Lexapro. Lexapro is a very good uh, treatment for depression, but it can be used for some anxiety disorders because serotonin is implicated in both conditions. SNRI, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, right? So epinephrine as a neurotransmitter is linked to both. So from a bio perspective or a physiological perspective, it makes sense that individuals with anxiety have uh, depression as a co-occurring diagnosis quite frequently because they share a pathway in the brain and they share neurotransmitters in the brain, in addition to a lot of the other things that our, our colleagues have suggested. They share symptomology, uh, the social uh, component uh, is part of it. There's a lot of explanations, but I just wanted you to understand why we say it's not a uh, not uncommon for within 10 years of being diagnosed with one to present with the other disorder. All right. So when we think of the DSM-5, and I mentioned this as my introduction, but the DSM-5 reconceptualize anxiety disorders. And now what used to be one chapter or one section of the DSM has been broken into three broad categories of, of disorders. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about anxiety disorders or your traditional anxiety disorders. And we're gonna discuss them separately or separate from obsessive compulsive related disorders. And we'll discuss them separate from trauma or stressor related disorders. The two uh, trauma related conditions we're gonna talk about are post-traumatic stress disorder and acute stress disorder. But these are, that's kind of the, the reconceptualization in a DSM-5 was to separate them out. So let's talk about generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder is viewed as a chronic anxiety disorder. Now, the word chronic means it's long-term. So a person with generalized anxiety disorder worries about everything and anything. So there is no specific trigger to the anxiety, it's more global. A person oftentimes feels anxious about everything and anything. You can think, if you can think about it, there is room to worry about it. So the idea from a cognitive perspective of catastrophizing, worrying about the worst to happen, that's a very common uh, thought error is, oh my God, this is gonna, what if this happened, what if? So uh, the what if game, if you have a client who manifests with what if this, and then you answer that, and then they say, well, what about this? Uh, that 
is suggestive of um, a nonspecific anxiety. So you might hear generalized anxiety disorder referred to as free floating anxiety because it doesn't have that singular trigger. Whereas a panic disorder has a specific trigger oftentimes, whereas phobias have specific triggers. You worry about everything and anything. And I, I will say people with generalized anxiety disorder even worry about the degree by which they worry. So there's something called a meta-worry, worrying about your worry. Am I worried too much? And then when you're not worried, you're worried, why am I not worried? So it's this constant tension or nervousness or sympathetic arousal. So what are the common uh, features of generalized anxiety disorder? Well, we have restlessness and inability to relax, muscle tension, dizziness, concentration difficulties, fatigue and sleep problems. Here's a good example of the overlap between anxiety and depression. These last two points, concentration is a, a problem both with generalized anxiety disorder and depression. Sleep issues are a problem with anxiety and depression. So you can see similar to what one of your peers said, the symptomology, there might be shared symptoms. And in therapy, if you were to ask, well, what do you think the source of your anxiety is? Your client is oftentimes going to say, I don't know. And that's their answer. And it's a truthful answer because genuinely they don't know why they're worried. So that's generalized anxiety disorder in terms of a diagnosis. It's a chronic condition where a person is worried more often than not. It's non-specific in terms of the cause of the anxiety and you have your symptomology here. Now, what's the epidemiology of the condition? So when I use the word epidemiology, we're talking about the relative distribution of the condition, prevalence or incidence rates, uh, whether it be in a single year or across a lifetime. And I think it's important to say that because if you open up the DSM, they're gonna say this disorder occurs roughly in X percent of people. But they do distinguish between uh, new diagnoses and life, lifetime incidence rates. So GAD, one in about 25 people are diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. And then across a lifetime, it's about one in 16 or 6%. Now, you will see, as I mentioned in an earlier lesson, you know, anxiety, depression, all psychological disorders target, doesn't matter what gender you are, but so no one is immune to a condition. And when I said that, that doesn't mean though, that there isn't a different prevalence rate across the genders. And what we, what we find is that anxiety is two times more frequently occurring amongst females relative to males. Can anyone suggest why females might have higher rates of generalized anxiety disorder? Why might females have higher rates of GAD? Let me see if I can call on someone. All right. Uh, Eileen, what do you think? Hi, sorry. Um, I, I think my first thought was something um, along the lines of um, 
Um, probably, I know that things like maybe childbirth or motherhood um, having to do with, I guess, maybe more hormonal things. Um, but I don't really, I, I don't want to be too detailed because I'm not really, I don't, I don't want to mix it up and not make sense. But I would say along those lines, but I, but when I thought that to myself, I was kind of thinking, well, you know, men become husbands and fathers. So I don't know, but I, I, I was originally thinking maybe something along the lines of hormones and things like that. Yeah. And I'm going to push back on that. One of the okay. tools of sexism is to say, oh, she's hormonal. Oh, she's this. And it has been used as a, an explanation for a lot of things inappropriately. And I, I don't think it's hormone related that, because if you're saying uh, hormones, you're talking about gender related hormones, testosterone, estrogen, or progesterone. These are the hormones that you're talking about. And I, I'm going to push back against that. What I will say is that there are social issues that are distinct to women. And when women have to navigate these unique pressures, it adds stress. For example, females are at greater risk of victimization than males. Not that males are not victimized in every form of victimization, but the rates of victimization are higher amongst females. The objectification of women is higher than the objectification of men. There are different standards of physical appearance for females relative to men. And I could go on. So there are unique pressures of life that females experience that uh, males don't experience to the same degree. And that is part of the answer as to why females have higher rates. I will also say this follows the general trend that I mentioned in another lecture that mood and affective conditions tend to be higher amongst females relative to males, whereas cognitive based conditions tend to be the rates are higher amongst males relative to females. I think I mentioned that there are certain patterns related to this. We also mentioned internalizing disorders are higher amongst females relative to males, whereas externalizing disorders have higher rates for males relative to females. So anxiety conditions are related to mood and affect. Plus, they're internalized. There are experiences within the body versus a person lashing out, breaking something, distracting a classroom, things of that nature, right? So there are a lot of explanations, whether we say um, the general paradigm we see, whether we say the unique experience of women and the pressures women face that males don't face, I will also say there is a potential referral bias. And that is part of the picture too. Females are more likely to seek treatment relative to males. So if females are saying, yeah, I'm struggling with this, it's possible that there are more males struggling with it that never wind up in a treatment. Now, would that explain double the frequency? The answer is no, it wouldn't but it explains some of it. And when we talk about etiology or causes or risk factors for a condition, we have to think about many different things. So I hope I've given you a little bit of flavor as to why maybe females have higher rates. GAD can be diagnosed across the lifespan, but it usually shows up in childhood and adolescence. And that makes sense when you think about the pressures that are fate that people start to face, particularly 
uh, in adolescence trying to figure out who am I, how do I fit in with my my peers, all of these things could induce anxiety. Now, if a person is diagnosed with GAD, one out of four people with GAD actually seek treatment. Now, keep this number in mind because it, it is an unwritten uh, message as to how severe this condition is relative to others. What do I mean by that? The more distressing a disorder is, the more likely a person is going to seek treatment for it. This has 25%. When we get to conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, the rates are much higher. So you'll see that as we go. So let's talk about, so, from a sociocultural perspective, I pose this question. Well, why is it that some people are at higher rates of a disorder than others? As it relates to generalized anxiety disorder, the sociocultural explanation is there's something to do with the environment or a situation that's triggering the symptoms of GED. So when I talked about uh, gender, I, from a sociocultural point of view, I was focused on the unique pressures women have. Poverty is another one. People who have lower socioeconomic status tend to have higher rates of generalized anxiety disorder than people who are in what we call middle class or upper class uh, financial strata. So poverty is a trigger. And imagine the anxiety that a person must feel not knowing if they can pay their, their rent or if they have enough money to buy food for the week or whether the electricity is going to be shut off or whether they're going to be evicted due to some kind of financial issue. So that is that is a another risk factor, unique stressors. Um, living in poverty is one of them. We also see in highly threatening environments, there are unique stressors. So if you were to go to Inner cities, um, Chicago, for example, has a very high murder rate. Being living in Chicago is going to induce anxiety more than living in a small rural community because the, the threat, it perhaps is lower, right? So these are you know, just examples. We also know amongst African-Americans, there's twice the rates of GAD relative to their uh, Caucasian counterparts. Question is why? Similar to the unique stressors that uh, women experience, ethnic minorities experience social pressures that I will never experience, right? So um, I'll never experience the uh, term shopping while black. When I go into a store, I don't have the implicit assumption that I'm going to steal or uh, having people follow me around uh, a store. This happens more frequently with African-Americans and that stereotype puts pressure. Racism, racism is another uh, issue. And anyone can experience racism, but African Americans experience racism at higher degrees than their Caucasian counterparts. So to give you a sociocultural uh, explanation, we're starting to understand, okay, why are some communities at greater risk than others? From a psychodynamic point of view, we have to think about Freud and his followers, right? So let's start with Freud. Freud's view of personality was the id, ego, and superego. And just as a quick reminder, the id 
was responsible for base pleasures and desires. The super ego was responsible for uh, morality and, and social expectations. And the ego was the mediator between the two. So a person can experience uh, normal or what is referred to as realistic anxiety. Uh, this is what we would call normal anxiety. But a person can have, from a psychodynamic perspective, neurotic anxiety or moral anxiety. Now listen to this. Neurotic anxiety occurs when the id is prevented from expressing itself. So if a person has a base pleasure and they're not allowed to express that pleasure, it results in neurosis. So I underline the id is being prevented from expressing itself because that's a core feature. Whereas when it comes to morality, that's what uh, the superego does. It determines what is right and wrong. So when it comes to moral anxiety, that's where you have an overly punitive superego, where the id did express itself, but it was punished for expressing itself. So those base desires are punished. Not that you couldn't do it, but when you do it, it's punished. So if you were to think about Freud, Freud would say that generalized anxiety disorder occurs uh, when you have this neurotic or moral anxiety that's unresolved, or the ego is not fully developed to help you cope or deal with this anxiety. So that would be Freud's explanation based on the framework of neurotic and moral anxiety. Now, I mentioned Freud and his followers, right? There were other perspectives as to what's going on in, with psychoanalysis, right? So we talked about object relations theorists. We talked about ego theorists, self theorists. There are a whole host of other perspectives in psychoanalysis. So one of the common explanations from a modern psychodynamic point of view is it has to do with parenting. So if you have uh, poor relationships or inadequate relationships between parents and children, that's going to induce anxiety. Or if you have highly punitive parents, that's going to lead to generalized anxiety disorders. So what do you do if you have generalized anxiety disorder? You push it beneath the surface. These uh, fears you push beneath the surface, but what Carl Jung would say, anything you push down will pop up in another way. So these are the other psychodynamic explanations for GAD. Now we could critique this explanation by asking, well, are people really pushing beneath the surface memories that are uncomfortable or embarrassing? Is that really what's happening? Uh, and in some case, maybe that occurs, but in most cases, people are not repressing memories. So that's a critique on the last bullet point here. Another critique is if it has to do with parenting, the question is how do people develop GAD if they have normal parenting? So there have to be other explanations for the development of GAD. So let's talk about the treatment. You will remember from lecture one, the cause of the disorder and the treatment are directly connected. So you'll see uh, the goals of psychodynamic treatment are free association. So it's a form of talk therapy, say whatever comes to mind. There is an emphasis on transference and resistance and dream analysis. Um, these are all parts of the treatment goals. So what would Freud say? My goal is to help you not be afraid to express your id impulses or not to have 
an overly punishing superego. That would be Freud, right? So from an object relations point of view, it would be, okay, if there's uh, relationship problems between a child and a parent, let's help uh, the child reconcile the, the problems that are inducing the anxiety. So from a large uh, scale data perspective, psychodynamic treatment in isolation has mo modest results. So we have to have other explanations and other treatments. Another explanation for GAD is the concept of conditions of worth. Now, when we talked about the different models or theories of, of um, mental illness, we talked about the humanistic and existential model. And Carl Rogers said one of the biggest problems a person has is this idea of conditions of worth. What is that? As a reminder, it's feeling that in order to get love or validation, you have to perform in a certain way. You have to behave in accordance with whatever the conditions are. So if you do well in the classroom, you're praised and you get my love. If you don't do well in the classroom, I withhold my love. And young children learn that early. And you may recall the example I gave uh, in Little League Baseball, how that could manifest. So what happens if a person uh, develops conditions of worth? Well, they start to reject or deny their thoughts, emotions, and, and modify their behavior to hit this standard. Now, the problem is that the standard is so high that they cannot meet the standard. And as a function of not meeting the standard, they start to become self-critical. And that criticism results in anxiety and anxiety becomes globalized. And that is what produces generalized anxiety disorder. And it makes sense, right? There, this explanation has some elements that are useful. Now, what are you going to do if you're going to treat generalized anxiety disorder? You're going to use client-centered therapy or person-centered therapy and the three core features, which are unconditional positive regard, empathy, and genuineness. Unconditional positive regard is we're giving you love and respect and acceptance no matter what. And that is meant to undo some of those conditions of worth you experience. And in order to do it, though, how do you give someone unconditional love, respect, uh, and a, like approval, acceptance, empathy? Empathy requires you to put yourself in their shoes. Your client is struggling. And the more you can put yourself in their shoes, the more you're able to love them for who they are as they are with no strings attached. And you also want to be authentic. You wanna teach authenticity. So instead of hiding one's natural desires or needs or thoughts or emotions, we encourage a person to find their voice and live an authentic life. So what are the goals? We're creating an emotional safety and emotional security within our client. And as we do that, we're in inviting our client to explore what their basic drives, needs, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are. And when we do that, the anxiety usually fades away. Similar to psychoanalysis, uh, client-centered therapy in isolation has modest results. And I keep saying in isolation because most of us use an eclectic approach to treatment. And the data is far more complex when you start to merge different uh, models of treatment together. From a cognitive point of view, we look at 
irrational beliefs, maladaptive thinking. So you're going to hear the the these two names very frequently. Albert Ellis is the originator of the approach of cognitive therapy called rational emotive behavioral therapy, REBT. And what Albert Ellis suggested is that if you have these irrational uh, beliefs, it's going to create anxiety. It's going to create cognitive distortions. So an example of uh, an irrational belief might be for a person to feel that they need to be loved or accepted by everyone in their their life. And the reality is very few people have a 100% approval rating. So if you worry about your approval and you set the standard so high, you're going to be disappointed. Another example, I think we talked about catastrophizing, expecting the worst to happen, but it's more general. Now that's Albert Ellis and some of the irrational assumptions. Aaron Beck is known for the traditional cognitive therapy. Um, and he focuses on the cognitive triad, which is focusing on the negative, a negative view of oneself, a negative view of one's future, and a negative a negative view as to whether it's global or specific in context. So these negative or suspicious beliefs, according to Aaron Beck, are uh, what's going to induce anxiety. And that anxiety becomes more global. So another explanation from a cognitive point of view uh, is just not being able to know what's going to happen. So a fear of the unknown, not being able to know the future can induce anxiety. So there are other explanations or newer cognitive explanations for GAD. So we talked about uh, meta worry. So we'll explain that a little more. So a meta cognitive theory uh, from this point of view, the argument is that worrying serves both good and bad purposes. So an individual who worries, are they're going to be able to detect a potential threat earlier. So that's the benefit of worrying. The alarm bells go off quicker. The downside is that it becomes excessive. And worrying can result in more worry and then ultimately worrying about your worrying, which we talked about as a meta worry. There's also um, an intolerance to uncertainty. So a person will automatically have a negative reaction to an uncertain outcome. And what do people do? People start to avoid uh, these uncomfortable states. So uh, people try and distance themselves from anything that's going to induce anxiety. But what's wild, according to this, is that people with GAD tend to start out with a higher level of arousal or discomfort than people without a diagnosis. So let's talk about uh, treatment. The first thing we're going to target are these maladaptive assumptions. We're going to identify irrational beliefs or assumptions. We're going to engage in something called cognitive restructuring, which is to undo that negative belief set and replace it with a more appropriate belief or a more tempered belief or assumption. And one of the tools that we use are homework assignments. So if you are with a clinician and they give you 
this week I'd like you to try this homework assignment. They're likely engaging in a CBT model. So the assigning of homework or recording thought records and so forth are pretty useful here. From a, a newer cognitive perspective, we try and impress upon our clients how worrying hurts them. And we try and show them that the amount by which they're worrying is actually reinforcing the disorder itself. So we want to encourage a reduction in worry. And then we try and change our mindset as to it's okay to worry. There are some contexts, there's normal anxiety, but then there's abnormal anxiety. So teaching people to have a normal reaction to worry versus a more extreme one. So that's a cognitive point of view. Now a cognitive point of view, uh, cognitive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy are highly effective in the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. Let's talk about biology. From a biological perspective, we're gonna look at your genetics. We're gonna look at brain structures, brain chemicals, uh, neurotransmitters and so forth. So if we were to do a family pedigree study, which is to map the number of biological relatives that have the same disorder, we would see a marked increase over three times the frequency than in the general population. I said across the lifespan, about 6% of people will, will be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. If you have biological relatives with this condition, it shoots up to approximately 15%. Um, so the closer the relative, the greater the likelihood. So first degree relatives, um, twins, parents, grandparents, that level of genetic similarity is going to increase the likelihood over cousins and, and so forth. So that's family pedigree. We also talk about brain regions or structures. So the basal ganglia, the limbic system, frontal cortex are all linked to generalized anxiety dis disorder. Uh, we also see there are three crucial neurotransmitters. GABA. So GABA is your primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. And we see low levels of GABA is linked to generalized anxiety disorder, which makes sense, right? Because if I have a neuron that's designed to inhibit anxiety and it's not working, my anxiety levels are gonna go up, right? So you're, it, the neurons are firing at a greater degree than they're supposed to. Now, the other neurotransmitters, which I mentioned, are serotonin and norepinephrine. You may recall I said, why is it that anxiety and depression um, have such a comorbidity? The answer is simple. They share neurotransmitters. So the more you share neurotransmitters, the more you share pathways, the more you're gonna have overlapping disorders. So how do we treat uh, generalized anxiety disorder from a biological point of view? Well, you might see people given benzodiazepine, things like Xanax. And Xanax is an interesting treatment because it targets the neurotransmitter of GABA. So it does reduce anxiety. It's an anxiolytic. Uh, the problem with treating generalized anxiety disorder with Xanax is it is habit forming. So there is a, an addiction potential to benzodiazepines. So a first line treatment, what we might consider before Xanax is SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is classically considered an antidepressant, right? 
but this antidepressant works for anxiety. A common example of an SSRI that works is Zoloft. So these are drug therapies. We could also use relaxation therapy, teaching people progressive muscle relaxation. It's quite useful in reducing anxiety. And we could also use biofeedback. Now biofeedback used to be a very expensive thing to do because the machinery uh, was high cost. But now with smart watches, more often than not, they track your heart rate. They track your stress levels. And we can use something like an Apple Watch to help a person reduce their heart rate. We can use uh, an Apple Watch in conjunction with relaxation exercises or breathing exercises to reduce muscle tension. And you can actually look at it and it will give you feedback. So give me a second. If I were to open up, now I don't have the Apple Watch, I have the Garmin, but uh, what you will see it, after it loads is it shows me my heart rate. It provides me a measure of my stress. So, and it will graph it out for me. I can look at that and in real time, modify my heart rate, modify my respirations, reduce my muscle tension. Now, Aaron, it looked like you had a question. Yeah, I was gonna ask um, with the Xanax and stuff, it, if they're always so addicting, then why do they keep prescribing it? Like, if it's like so deadly? Question. Um, when we look at something like a Xanax, it is not the first line treatment because of the abuse potential. But that being said, it does work. It works for breakthrough anxiety and things of that nature. So we don't generally um, take the extreme approach of getting rid of the drug altogether if it works. You might ask yourself, why is it that we have opiates on the market, right? If they're so addictive? The answer is, Post-surgery, they do a very good job helping you deal with pain. The problem isn't the prescription of it uh, with appropriate needs. It's the over-prescribing or the inappropriate usage of the drug. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Now, if you look here, you can see at the top it shows my heart rate, right? So if I were in an anxiety state, what I would do is I would start um, working on my breath and I would slow down my breathing. Because when you're in a state of anxiety, you're in sympathetic arousal. So slowing down my breath is gonna reduce my heart rate. When I reduce my heart rate, it's gonna uh, trigger the parasympathetic nervous system to take over and my anxiety will go away. So it's pretty cool. We don't need anything more than a smartwatch for biofeedback today because it gives us a measure of stress. It gives us a measure of heart rate. Some of the more sophisticated ones give us respiration rates and we can, we can modify them in real time. Uh, Interesting, I have a client who uh, has a phobia linked to flying. And he had to get on an airplane. And before he got on the airplane, I took him through some of these relaxation exercises or breathing exercises and biofeedback. And what I asked him to do is hook his uh, watch to the Wi-Fi and, and track his heart rate and focus on his breath work. And sure enough, 
he found that to be a very useful piece of information in real time to help him relax. It's not the only one, right? As clinicians, we try and have multiple tools in our toolbox. So we, we will target inappropriate thoughts. We will target um, uh, sympathetic arousal with heart rate and whatnot. Uh, but we try many different things uh, as we're treating. So that's uh, biological treatment. Now I'm going to stop the recording here to separate out generalized anxiety disorder from phobias. So let me stop the recording.